Hello, everybody. Happy Tuesday, and welcome to another episode of Positively Connected in Dogs. Today, I am joined by a fellow dog training colleague, Ashley Lambert. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about something that a lot of us dog trainers have been talking about behind the scenes. Um, and it actually has come up quite a bit in one of the groups that I run. I'm an admin in a training group called Alaskan Malamute Training. And it comes up a lot because our audience is not all based in the U.S. And the reason this becomes a challenge for us as we are training our dogs is when we start to cover the concept of management. Because because there are different regulations around the world that can control kind of how people use management. Um, and it's always something that we talk about a lot in dog training because our plans generally that we give to our clients are a combination of both management and training in order to help our dogs be successful with their training programs. So Ashley, do you wanna start off with kind of defining or explaining what we mean when we say management? Um, so yeah, I would define, I guess, management as <clears throat> um, uh, appropriately uh, having a semblance of like control of your dog and its environment, mm -hmm. right? So um, a lot of management techniques could be uh, tethering your dog to you, crate tra training, things like that. Yep. Yeah. And we're generally using management in our training plans to help prevent the dog from practicing the inappropriate or undesired behavior. Because we know with learning, anytime a behavior happens and it gets rehearsed, if there's reinforcement there, that behavior is going to get stronger. So let's think, for example, about um, jumping up on the counters and stealing food. Counter surfing is a big challenge that a lot of our pet people deal with. And the moment those front feet go up and we're sniffing all the food up there, maybe we grab something of interest, that behavior of counter surfing gets reinforced because the dog was able to practice that behavior and get something, right? When they steal that turkey off of our counter, that behavior gets a lot harder to get rid of. So management is used to help prevent those inappropriate behaviors from happening so that we can teach our dogs what we do want from them so that they only get that opportunity to rehearse that desired behavior. But management can certainly be a lot of different techniques. And I think a lot of people, when they think of management, they think of crates, right? Because that's kind of the big one. But that's actually what brought us together today because there was a new law that came out in Sweden that banned the use of crates. So Ashley, do you wanna kind of share a little bit about what you know about that law? Okay, so um, it actually came to my attention um, during a conversation with another trainer. Um, I, I think we were driving to a competition and they said, Sweden banned crates. And it was a very general way to say yeah. something. <laughs> very and, nonchalant. <laughs> yeah, and I was just like, oh, okay. and. They were like, I think that's such an issue. And I was just like, well, why? It They had to collectively agree to ban the crates. And, you know, it turned into something where she was mentioning that without crates, she couldn't see how you would successfully, like, potty train a puppy mm -hmm. or um, successfully, you know, manage uh, a destructive dog. And I was like, well, they they didn't say confinement was illegal. They mm -hmm. said crating was illegal. And for me, I thought it was brilliant because there was like a certain amount of hours. And you'd really have to think about getting a dog if you knew you couldn't crate it for several hours. Yeah. <laughs> you'd have to make sure you had the time to spend with that animal. So it wasn't to to from my point of view it wasn't such a big issue right um i so we got into this very interesting argument about having crates in sweden because they're allowed to have them in their car right because that's for safety it's just that when an animal is left unattended they cannot be in a box basically is what they're saying no boxes you can find another way to confine them but no boxes and i guess she had like lost the side of, okay, what do I do if I don't have a box? Which yeah. was kind of 
amusing to me. Yeah. Well, and I think that that's a challenge that a lot of our pet owners run into because, you know, X, I think X pens and baby gates are starting to gain a little more uh, regularity, I will say, among the basic pet people. But in general, when we think of confinement, when we think of, you know, managing our puppies, we think of crates. And certainly I use crates in my my regular routine with my dogs. We have crates in the car for traveling for safety. We bring crates when we go to trials and shows. Um, I'm not crating them for long periods in the home, but I do think that it brings up an interesting point of animal welfare too, because it's not that the crates themselves were, con- were banned, it's how we use the crates. And yeah. I think that that brings up an interesting point because I think that a lot of the times we are relying too much on using the crate to just manage the dog, like get the dog out of the picture because it's driving you nuts or it's destructive. When in reality, we need to view them more as a short-term solution that we use intermittently instead of, you know, relying on that as the bulk of our training program. Yeah. And I was also thinking that you can technically more successfully, at least from my viewpoint, more successfully adjust a dog to a crate and crate train them and get them to um, quote unquote, like a crate. If you are, you know, if you aren't using it as like, okay, I need to leave and I've got to throw the dog in the crate. Like, of course they're sitting there like, wait a minute, you just stuck me in this box. Yeah. Um, But, and a lot of pet owners on top of that don't know about putting things that are, of value or of intrigue into the crate with Mm -hmm. the dog so that they don't go bored out of their mind just sitting in a box for several hours like who knows when that owner is going to come home and especially for you know like young puppies as well i i agree that dogs should know how to be crated Mm -hmm. you know that's a really an important skill to have and i think it's normal but i mean if you even look at the way we puppy raise right now right because i've got a litter of puppies Mm-hmm. as we're teaching the little puppies to like the crates, part of it is just sticking the crate in there with an open door and they still have all of this other freedom in the weaning pen, but the crate is there with an open door for them to investigate and go lie down in. That's how we're introducing three to four week old puppies, yeah. you know, to crates. So think of a dog that gets adopted from a shelter that has no idea what that lifestyle yeah. is like it's it's slightly more unfair essentially mm-hmm. to basically throw them into a crate and expect them to be okay with it <laughs> agreed yeah absolutely yeah you're seeing a lot of even teenagers and i think that's a whole nother discussion but you're seeing you know young dogs being adopted or young dogs even purchased from breeders that maybe aren't setting them up for success you know with initial crate training we get a dog, assume that, oh, dogs go in crates when we're not around because we need to prevent them from doing naughty things. And and we are, we're, people are just throwing these dogs into crates without putting in that initial work on training and conditioning it to be something positive. And so, you know, you'll see online and in pet groups, threads about, oh, just let them scream it out, let them cry, you know, and you're like, oh my gosh, this poor puppy is getting traumatized in this you know, in this space that's supposed to be a safe place for them, that in reality, you know, we're just ruining this for them. Mm -hmm. So let's start with that puppy age group, because I know that you've got a litter right now. Talk to us a little bit about the setup that you have for our puppy, your puppies. So they're not being forced into crates, but they still have access to one. So talk to us a little bit about your setup. So right now, I haven't even stuck a crate in there, right? I, they're, they're, getting to that stage right now my setup is that they have a little potty patch to potty on and they have an entire like like little play floor and i would call it maybe like a five foot by six foot area that they're allowed to roam in they have the potty patch so they're wait whenever they wake up they walk in the general direction of the potty patch sometimes they're off by like an inch but at this age you know, that's to be expected. Um, And they keep themselves within that area pretty much. Um, And unless I go there to take them to another area, that is where they stay now, basically 24 hours a day, 
seven days a week. And they, you know, I don't come home to a house that's, you know, covered in pee and poo. They're in that little space. Mm -hmm. And they have a spot to sleep, they have a spot to play, and they have a spot to use the restroom. And they're doing it successfully in that area. When they get older, they'll get another, you know, mini upgrade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you plan on keeping a puppy from this litter? I actually do. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So how will you transition this puppy? You know, as they start to age, generally we'll see puppies go home between eight and, you know, 12 weeks of age. So as you start having fewer puppies to, to be at home with and, and manage, how do you plan on transitioning your keeper puppy from the big group setup into a more one on one setup? So what I intend to do is I'm starting them off where they can all kind of go into a crate, explore it, check it out. Um, Then I'm going to actually, they do little mini training sessions right now. They're learning what the clicker is. I'll bring a crate out. Um, I have intentions to like stick a licky mat in the back of the crate. And anytime they basically wander into the crate, they get a licky mat. And those are individual sessions, right? So they're Mm -hmm. learning to kind of walk into a crate, lick on a licky mat, you know, engage with something. And then, you know, they can come out at their, at their will. Um, So I'll start creating them individually and maybe in a row all together. And then Mm -hmm. slowly by slowly, maybe I'll stick two at a time out at night and then one at a time out at night. And then basically slowly by slowly, they're going in crates by themselves and going to sleep, but they're associating the crate with something positive at first, then moving to, um, you know, being able to do it by themselves and work around a crate by themselves and then moving to, um, sleeping in groups individually in crates Mm -hmm. and then eventually two by two and singles. (laughs) singles. <laughs> yeah. And how long, how many weeks will you have that transition be? So they are going to be four weeks now and uh, the puppies are going to be leaving at 10 weeks. So they will have basically upwards of six weeks where they're going to be able to make that transition. Yeah. Um, and even so, I always recommend with people who take their puppies home don't create the puppy in a completely different room at first create them with you so that they know that you're there they're all going home with like um little i guess comfort toys that smell like their litter mates so that you can Mm -hmm. stick it in the kennel with them if you feel like it you know but those are like that's an important step because being removed from you know family and all of that that's a really traumatic experience for a puppy yeah, you know? absolutely. And <laughs> they're they're used to waking up and seeing each other. <laughs> yeah. So Yeah. Yeah, it, I think fun. that's important to note too that so first of all not all breeders give their puppies the slow transition that you are, which is very good for your puppies, right? But that's over several weeks. And I think a lot of people, again, will pick their puppy up, take them home and expect to be able to just put the puppy in the crate all night, you know, have it spend time during the day while they're maybe working from home. And that's not how learning works. You know, you're giving them lots of time to adjust and explore and figure out that that's a good place to sleep and a good place to be. And then even after the rest of the puppies go home, you're still giving your puppy opportunities to move in and out of that space so that we're not just putting them in and closing them. Yeah. And I love that concept too of offering enrichment, offering, you know, comfort tools in the crate. That's something that of course we want to do. You know, if we're trying to create a safe place Uh, for our puppies, teaching them that the crate is a good place to be. We want to offer them things to keep themselves busy and promote relaxation. And, you know, that can start with, and and it's not always food items. I think a lot of people always assume it has to be food items, but things that smell familiar, things that feel familiar, all of that goes a really long way into helping those puppies transition comfortably. Yeah, I agree. And not to mention like, I know actually with a dog that I'm training right now, I know that it seems like it's always like food, 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 food. Uh Um, And what I had to explain um, is that the food, yes, it, you know, it gets used. However, 
you're using the food to promote another behavior that is generally relaxing to the dog, like sniffing Mm -hmm. or with a snuffle mat. Right. So we're, we're encouraging the sniffing. The food happens to be the bonus, right? Like there needs to be something to sniff for. And um, like with chewing or licking, like those are all things that calm dogs down. So Mm -hmm. you're not just, teaching them like you're not just saying oh like here's some food it's more you're teaching them how to actually soothe themselves when they're in that situation yep at the same time so it's not just the fact that okay i stuck my dog in a crate with a a kong that has like frozen yogurt in it it's the fact that he's going to be there licking at it trying to get things out so that maybe one day when i just stick him in there with a rubber kong maybe he'll just chew on the kong knowing that it's going to soothe him yep Yep. Building up that history of that behavior, teaching them good habits, giving them outlets that start with food, but ultimately reinforce those other behaviors of licking and chewing that promote relaxation. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So with our puppies, generally I'm using, you know, um, X pens, setting up larger spaces for them and giving them access to that crate. And I'm really spending time conditioning that crate to something positive before I'm just closing that door and expecting them to be comfortable with it. Do you find yourself mostly relying on those two tools for in the house management with puppies or do you use others? Um, from time to time, depending on the puppy, I will also use like holding a leash, mm-hmm. right? Um, I'm still probably going to give them very similar enrichment, but dogs, you know, do like to be part of our general area. They like to be with us. Um, my house right now isn't that big. It's like 900 and something square feet. So like the dog can't really get anywhere <laughs> yeah. that I can't see. But for people who have larger houses, you know, having them, having a dog that's like on a leash or tethered to you. I had one dog that was really just her off button was terrible. Mm-hmm. And so I would put her on a tether just to reinforce, hey, just lie down mm-hmm. and hang out here. And every few seconds, I'll give you a treat. And we worked from it being on like this little tether to then putting her on place, you know, and mm-hmm. she would just, she, she would know too. She would see me get everything ready and she'd just run onto the place and be like, okay, I'm lying here. <laughs> She's <laughs> like, this is what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. As I, I find that as we move into kind of those teenage times, you know, that six to 18 month range, we're generally starting to get dogs that are a little bit more active, dogs that are, maybe more opportunistic. They're definitely bigger, so they can definitely access more things. And I think that sometimes our our pet people get duped into thinking, oh, like my big puppy is behaving so nicely. And then we hit these teenager times and they're like, what has happened, right? And they've already like let up on all of their management. And I'm like, no, no, bring that back out. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) But it can be hard because as they get bigger, then we get jumping up on that gate, right? So then we have to reinforce four on the floor inside yeah. that that gate. So I think that it's important for people to remember that, you know, as your puppy starts starts maturing, we want to make sure that we keep reinforcing all of that good behavior with our management so that it's almost like a seamless transition from puppyhood into teenager, into adult. And then one day that management can just kind of fade away slowly. And all of those behaviors that we've been building with those teenagers, you know, and puppies starts to become their normal behavior. Yeah, Um, that is, it's a funny thing when you try to explain to pet parents that, yes, just because it's bigger doesn't mean it's not still a puppy. Yeah, they're still going through growing phases where, and one in particular that I, that I love is teenage phase when they're just like I'm not gonna listen to you yeah I might have listened to you from eight weeks to to four months but nah I don't feel like it now yeah (laughs) this is interesting and I want that more and this is way cooler than you are mom bye (laughs) yeah and it's I I have to tell people it's always like it's like a kid yeah it's definitely like a kid you have to wait until you get into like you know that two three you know range and then it's kind of like okay now 
they've decided. <laughs> yeah. Now <laughs> all of those adults. treats that I've been putting in those behavior jars yeah. are finally paying off. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's a work in progress. And just like people don't stop learning, your dog mm-hmm. doesn't stop learning. And just like we make mistakes, they're going to make mistakes. You just have to be there to make sure that you guide them back to the right point. Yeah. Yeah. I think something else too, that a lot of people that I've been talking to recently are having trouble, particularly with like puppies and teenagers and management is that a lot of people are working from home right now and they're not used to working from home. And so they're having puppies that are, or teenagers that are barking in X pens or crates, you know, and when the dog is with them, it's constant attention seeking behavior. So we have to find that balance too, of using the management appropriately, not overdoing it. So the dog's getting frustrated, still meeting the dog's needs, but also using it so that we're not, oh, okay, you're too frustrating in your X pen be yeah. with me. And then we start reinforcing all this attention seeking behavior, right. right? So how do you help people find that balance of using the management, but also not becoming dependent on it? Oh, we might Second. have lost you. There we go. I got you back. Okay. You froze there for you minute. go. You're back. So Hold on. Um, I am going to, let's see. Um, Uh, That's actually a really great question because I now have a client that was dealing with this exact problem. Um, They got the the puppy is a teenage puppy. She's six months old. I think almost seven months old. Very, very, you know, exuberant puppy as well. Like she is, um, she is not, you know, little miss chill and relax. Doesn't come with an Uh, automatic settle mat. No, no. Doesn't come with an automatic settle button. And she had the previous history of being a feral puppy. So they adopted her at six months old. You know, she was in a foster home situation. um, But sometimes that can be a little bit dicey, too, because um, foster homes tend to be a little bit overly sympathetic to the dog situation to the point where they don't necessarily want to train the dog. Mm -hmm. They just want to bring the dog comfort. And while that's all well and good, it can be a little bit um, negative when Mm -hmm. the adopters get the dog and they're like, I don't know what to do with it. This dog has um, no boundaries. (laughs) Yes, this dog has no boundaries. So what we actually did is um, initially I had them create those boundaries for that dog. Like initially just letting her know that if she wanted to be with her owners, that she had to lie down and relax. Mm -hmm. There is no, okay, I'm here and I'm just going to like cause havoc while you're, (laughs) while you're having your zoom meeting um, and jump all over you and stuff. So um, if she can manage lying down and receiving a cookie every so often, you know, she's allowed to stay. If not, we're going to go and give the puppy something engaging Mm -hmm. in another room. That's going to take her a little bit to finish And, um, that's what's, you know, that what her little, her minor consequence is going to be is that she can't be with you if she's not going to, you know, calm down or be quiet. Yep. And they were having the issue because they had two separate offices of the dog initially barking if she, you know, if she was left alone, they've actually made a lot of progress. And he's told me like, she will come in, she'll lie down. And while I'm in my meeting, I just, you know drop one piece of kibble. And if she's lying there and she's relaxed, she gets to stay. And, you know, um, it's worked out really well for them so Mm -hmm. far, just knowing that, okay, if I cannot handle the dog right now, I can put the dog somewhere else with something that's engaging and let them do that. And I told them a week before they got started working a week to two weeks before they got started, you know, having to go back to work from home Mm -hmm. um, digitally, um, I was telling them, do it in small increments where you leave her out here and you just go into another room. Start with two minutes and leave her with the thing. Then start, you know, increasing the amount of time you're leaving her with the object for right now so that she can learn to self-soothe as well. Yeah. And then, but don't, I was just like, do not wait for, wait for work day and try to see if you're going to be able to entertain her for you guys being gone for 10 to 12 hours in your offices. It's not yeah. going to work like that. Yeah. Start from now. 
Well, and, and I, what- <laughs> yeah, I think that brings up a super interesting thing that a lot of people are dealing with too, is that in some parts of the world, people are going back to work now. People yeah. who have been home for a year and spent all this time with their dog are now all of a sudden leaving their dogs and expecting that their dogs can just handle being alone. Yeah. And so in my mind, you know, of course, we don't want to overuse crates. We don't want to overuse management. But to some extent, management can help us make sure that we can still have a dog that can be confident when alone. And that is such an important life skill for all dogs to have. Because we never know when there's going to be an emergency that's going to pull us away. We never know when we're going to have to send our dog to boarding or to stay with a friend's house and they have other dogs and the dogs have to be separated, right? Like no matter what your life looks like now, we've got to start figuring out now and don't wait until we need it, right? Mm -hmm. Figure out now how we can teach our dogs to be confident by themselves. And those activities, you know, just little pieces of them every single day, increasing that length, you know, is important for them. The funny uh, thing is, is I actually just wrote an article about that. Um, I'll have to share it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, 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 part of um, the training, the it was a Plaza Your Paws dog training in Miami, Florida. It mm-hmm. was part of basically what I was doing for them um, when I worked for them. And uh, the, the article is about the COVID puppies and yeah. us really when we went back to work our do- all our dogs knew was oh well they were here all the time like what do you mean you're leaving yeah um and then we sat there and we were just like okay um well what do we do my my puppy doesn't know how to be by itself and it's just like you know to it, it's no fault of theirs really for not re- for not knowing they were most people thought we have so much time mm-hmm we we can we can get a dog because we have so much time we have time to train it we have time to but didn't remember the part of the training where they have to give the dog time alone yeah you know you don't spend every waking moment with the dog because the dog needs to know how to be alone yeah and coming from someone who got a covid puppy that wasn't the intention i had planned on getting a puppy last year regardless but it happened to come during covid time yeah um so many sessions where I would just, I'm, I'm in the house. It doesn't matter, but I would make a licky mat and stick her in the crate mm-hmm. because what if there's a day where I need to just leave you in the crate and get yeah. out of the house? Yep. You need to be able to lie in the crate and, you know, relax until I get back. So we did a lot of sessions like that, where I just put her in while I worked on the computer for a little bit, put her in while I, and I've had to, you know, remind people out here as well like don't forget to put the puppy away Mm -hmm. don't forget to put the puppy away because (laughs) because we got to start building those foundations now because we're gonna need them we're not going to be stuck in our homes in isolation you know for forever so making sure that we're and I think the other problem that people are running into is again maybe they were expecting to have more time And all of a sudden, hey, you're going back to work next week. And oh, shoot, now we have a puppy that hasn't been crated or confined at all. And now we need to like jump on that. And I think that it's important for people to realize that just putting their puppy in the crate, even if you put your puppy in the crate with a Kong, is not okay. It's got to be a slow transition. Otherwise, we are likely going to create some pretty significant stress, which is only going to make trying to get them comfortable with those tools harder. Yeah. 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 So I, one other thing about management that I think is important is that people only think of management for puppies and they tend to forget that even adult dogs need management and need those life skills. And a lot, you know, the, the households that come to mind are the people that start having kids, right. And their dog is five and hasn't been confined, but by any means since it was younger, right? Or maybe we bring in a new puppy and we have to make that transition nice and slow. Um, Maybe we decide to get a cat or a bird and need to keep the species kind of separate from one another for safety. So how do you generally recommend that your clients keep management 
involved, even when they don't necessarily feel like they need it. Because I think that's the problem that that people feel is my dog is now well behaved. I don't need these tools anymore. Um, <clears throat> so when I was in Miami, I always used to bring up the emergency situation, right? Uh -huh. um, I used to people when people said, Oh, no, they're really good now. So I don't really stick them in the crate anymore. And I don't do this. And I don't do and I go, hold on. You know, especially when I lived in Florida, I would say, you know, if a hurricane comes by and we have to evacuate and go to a shelter, dogs have mm -hmm. to be confined in crates. And they'll be like, wait, I wasn't yeah. thinking about that. <laughs> yeah. So I will generally, or what if you want to go out of town and board your dog, the, boards get, the dogs get boarded in kennel. Mm -hmm. And what if you want to do this? And, you know, it, it would get into a thing where they would be like, oh, I think what happens is they don't realize sometimes what circumstances exist. Yep that where, where they're going to need a dog that is going to be comfortable in a crate, mm -hmm. right? They don't think about that. They sit there and they say, oh, but the dog's good in the house mm -hmm. and therefore everything's fine. So usually my first step is to remind them of all the things that exist where you might not want your dog, you know, stressing mm -hmm. and acting a fool a little bit in yep. the crate in that situation. And um, then gradually remind them you know still every so often put the dog in their x-pen put the dog in their crate give them something to do you know go do something that isn't you know that isn't doing being with the dog or allowing mm -hmm. the dog to run of the house and usually that'll get them to get back into the rhythm of things like reminding yeah. them what they did with the dog as a puppy because the same idea applies mm -hmm. um and reminding them why it's probably essential yeah. to keep doing it, even though you have a well-behaved dog in the home. Me personally, even though I could probably trust my dogs loose in my house, mm -hmm. they go in my bedroom. They've got tons of chews. They sleep most of the time, you yeah. know, if I'm away and I leave them in my bedroom. Um, but right now my older dog, because I have puppies, she goes in the crate and I know I can stick her in the crate and crate her. And it's not going to be a big deal because she is used to being crated. She might get a lot of freedom, but she still knows that if I ask her to go in the crate, okay, just walk in. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not, it's not a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it's important to remind people too, that just because the dog had the skill earlier in life doesn't mean they'll just retain it. I mean, I, when I was in middle school, I started studying Spanish. By the time I graduated college, I was fluent in it. I have not spoken or read Spanish since. If I were to have a conversation with somebody, it would be challenging. You know, I could probably very messily <laughs> muddle my way through it, but it would be hard, right? So the skills that we don't use, the skills that aren't reinforced, they decrease in fluency. We yeah. lose a piece of them. And so, and it doesn't have to be, you know, again, when we're walking puppies through management, it's usually a lot of hand holding, a lot of activity, a lot of enrichment. But once the skill is established, it's usually pretty easy to maintain, you know, and it doesn't have to require a lot of time from us. Yeah. Um, we have crates set up in our bedroom. The dogs are not crated when we leave. But if I were to be cooking, right? And I'm like, oh my gosh, all this food is out and I realize I don't have an ingredient. Well, I'm not going to leave my dogs out with the temptation of all the food on the counter, right? So let's go in your crate with a Kong and you're going to be crated for 10 minutes while I run down the street and grab the ingredient, right? So they've got that enrichment. It's not something that they're confined in every day, but those kind of here, let me give you something really high value to keep reinforcing it. Um, you know, every once in a while, you might decide to give a licky mat while you're on a call, you know, and the dog is in the crate or confined in the X pen working on that puzzle. So it can be easy things that you just do here or there um, yeah. that could even be food enrichment. So we're really big on teaching people how to ditch the bowl and yeah. feed creatively as much as possible to work the brains. So mm -hmm. it could even be as easy as, hey, I still have that crate out and we're not necessarily closing the dog in it anymore, but hey, I'm gonna scatter feed 
your whole yeah. meal in the crate and you're just going to walk around in that space. So it can be really easy activities for, for you and your dog. It doesn't have to be like you have to set aside a bunch of time each week to keep that skill. Yeah. And it's, a, it's something that trainers should think about too, because each one of us is a little bit different about how we keep our houses. But mm -hmm. I know when I go and I visit my friend in Oklahoma, the dogs are crated quite often. Mm -hmm. Right. But I can open a crate and ask them to go in and they're just like, okay, you know, sometimes some people are just like, oh, no, 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 my dogs don't sleep here and they don't jump on the furniture and whatever who you're in someone else's house, they might have rules, but at least my dogs aren't going to get stressed out that this is the rule in this house. Right. You know, so I, I think it's really important for pet parents. Yes. But for other trainers as well to not just drop the ball on the, you know, on certain things just mm -hmm. because, you know, you can trust your dog. Yep. I can trust my dogs around my food. Mm -hmm. I can. I walked out one day, AT&T came, even my puppy. I, you know, like I, I, they were just like having this long conversation with me. And I remember it. I was just like, I left my food on the coffee table. <laughs> and I literally, when they were done, I opened the door and there are all my dogs just standing at the door. Like we were just wondering when you were getting back, you know, <laughs> you're like, thank you training. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. But you know, that's not everyone's dog. And I shouldn't like, if I had another dog in the house, I shouldn't expect that, that my food is going to be there. When yeah. I get back. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think that's important. I think, I think one thing that can get hard for people too is, that concept of cre creativity, right? I always want a dog that I am teaching to be resilient and that I am teaching to um, be able to adapt to any situation I put them in. You know, we travel a lot with our dogs. Um, we do all kinds of sports with our dogs. There's, there's always going to be something new that they're presented with. And I always want them to be able to just kind of go with the flow. And so I think that then comes on us as trainers and dog caregivers as well is don't rely on the same tool over and over in the same way. Make sure that your dog is understanding that concept of management in a variety of ways. Yeah. So what are, we've talked a lot about crates and X pens. We mentioned a little bit of a leash tether to the human. What are some other forms of management that you use or that your clients use? Um, so using like a separate room, like the bathroom. Um, <clears throat> I used to advise it for it because I had some clients who didn't have a crate. And, you know, between lessons, they got to wait on the crate to get delivered. And I would be like, well, if you don't have a bunch of mats, go ahead and stick them in the bathroom. And, um, you know, put them in the bathroom for a little bit. I used to use the the bathroom or another room as a form of management for even like uh, dogs that were reactive at the door, like mm -hmm. initially reactive at the door. And, you know, um, I always say like, I'm good with three barks and a thank you or four barks and a thank you. But if they start going nuts and they were rushing at the door. Uh, so I had a client with a Malinois mix that mm -hmm. I was just like, okay, if he continues after you've said, you know, he wants, you know, if he wants to be in the space, if he can't settle down, we're going to go ahead. We're just going to put him in the bathroom for 30 seconds, mm -hmm. you know, and then bring him back out. At the very least, there's nothing in the bathroom he can really get into. Mm -hmm. Normally, you can usually move those things out of the way or higher to where the dog can't reach them. Um, I know some people who even use a laundry room. Yep. So, um, you know, it's a space. It's usually... Uh, people usually like laundry rooms because it's like right off of uh, there's usually a door to like the backyard or the garage. You know, yep. it's really easy to get them out if yep. they need to. Um, so I've, I, I, I've seen the laundry room technique. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's another point too. the outside. You know, sometimes I'll use my backyard. Our backyard is fenced. That's a form of management. Um, yep. We have a back deck that I can easily put um a baby gate up. So if I want the dogs to be outside, all their potty needs have been met, but I don't necessarily want them having free access to the yard for whatever reason. I might put that that baby gate up so they can still be outside but be away from us. And oftentimes, you know, I'll just use the entire backyard including the deck 
as management as well. If I need to, let's say I spill something, right? And I, okay, guys, let's go outside. I open the door, they go out, and then I can easily mop it up or whatever without them being underfoot. So it can be as easy as that. And I, I always like to remind clients that we're not just throwing them in the bathroom or throwing them in the laundry room or throwing them outside, right? We're putting that on cue and we're teaching that being in that space is an okay place to be and then using that to our, to our advantage, right? Later on, a lot of dogs I know have trouble being outside alone. Um, They want their people with them. But again, just like we talked about earlier with giving licky mats, giving enrichment puzzles, giving activities in an X-Pen or in a crate with the door open. I do the same thing with the backyard. You know, we're going to have breakfast out of a Kong wobbler. It's going to be on the back deck. The door is going to be open. No pressure. You don't have to stress about being locked out there by yourself. Right. But that's where the fun thing's happening. And it's actually better to be out there. Right. Right. And then once that gets more comfortable, then we start closing the door. Right. So again, even with using those spaces as management to help prevent unwanted behaviors, I'm still teaching those as a positive place. Both you can hang out here and it's a good thing. And can I get you here on cue? Right. Because I never want to physically grab my dog and move them from point A to point B. Yeah. And I would say another form of management in the house, it's not something that people generally think of, but if if it's particularly strong, it's a good one, which is a place cue. Mm-hmm. You know, if you if you do need to vacuum or do something or go anywhere, if your dog has a nice, strong place cue, sending them to place and getting what you need, you know, what you need to get done done mm-hmm. is really nice as well. You know, I've got a couple of most of my dogs are pretty good at it. Um, my my oldest one is. I taught it more as like, uh, as we're training, go to plays. So she's not used to it as being like a household behavior. Mm -hmm. But my other two dogs know it more as like, hey, I'm doing something right now, go to place. And they'll, you know, they know, okay, we'll go on here, we'll hang out. Uh, Maybe she'll give us a a bully sticker or something. And yeah, you go do what you want. Um, (laughs) So yeah. Yeah. And I, that's, that's interesting. I use the same thing. So ours is settle on a mat and it means tummy to bed until I ask you to do something else. And that's something I condition really strong right off the bat. And it brought something up in my mind of, of that a lot of times when our dogs are being naughty, um, I think people will go, okay, I can't handle this. You're being overwhelming. I need to just put you in your crate. Or people think of, dinner. They don't want their dog begging. They don't want their dog jumping up on the counters. So we think I'm just going to avoid that situation completely and put you in the crate. And I want to remind everybody (laughs) that while that's okay to do occasionally, remember that if we're doing that, it ultimately means that our dog isn't learning what we do want them to do. So when I have a puppy in the house, am I sometimes putting it in the crate when I eat because I need to eat in peace? Absolutely. But if I rely on that, my dog's never going to learn how to relax on a bed while I eat. Yeah. Right. So I think that we then, that then brings up that concept of how do we manage the use? How do we manage the use of management? Right. Yeah. And how do we incorporate training to make sure that our dogs are still progressing in our training plans? Right. And I think that that definitely goes to in some cases, the individual, because I do know a lot of trainers who are just like, oh, we're going to do things now. So we're going to put the dogs in the crate Mm -hmm. and the dogs happily run over there and, you know, whatever. And if that's your expectation in life, I mean, more power to you. Me personally, I like my dogs to be around me. I like them to be in my space. And so I teach them that in order to be in my space, this is what I expect of them. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't think it's, fair of me not to share that information with them because eventually that that's that's what I want you know Mm -hmm. I don't always want to have to um confine a puppy or you know another dog to the crate I want to be able to sit down on the couch have a cheeseburger and my dogs either like my dogs personally they'll they'll lie around me Mm -hmm. but they're not begging um and I the I show them that from the get-go. If I am eating, I have a whole training session with that. I'll eat. 
I'll have something there to eventually give the dog. Mm -hmm. And if they lie down and they don't look at my food and they're just hanging out, I will drop a treat for them. Yep. And they learn that in this space, whenever she, whenever she sits down and she eats, we lie down and we leave her alone. Yeah. And um, I think it's important to remember that most people want that. And usually if you start to teach it from there, you know, you're basically cueing the dog whenever you grab food at that point. Like whenever you grab food for yourself, yeah. the dogs are automatically like, oh, we're going to go here and this is what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. And if you teach that it's the crate, just realize that whenever you grab food, your dog might start running into the crate. Yeah. Thinking like, I'm not supposed to be here. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's my cue. I'm supposed to be gone. <laughs> yeah. 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 And there's a very easy way, you know, teaching a dog a settle on a mat or a place or even just a lay down with that amount of duration and that much distraction takes time. Yeah. You know, it's it's something that might be easier for people like us whose brains are just always in training mode, right? We always know when to watch and reinforce the dogs. But I think that that can be challenging for a lot of people, especially people living with those more impulsive dogs. Yes. Right? The dogs that are like, food, that's for me, right? And like jump into your face. Yeah. So I think that it's important to remember that you might need to start some of those foundations when there isn't food around, mm -hmm. right? It might not be that, hey, every time I grab my food and sit, I'm going to pay the dogs. That might be step two or three for some of those puppies or a, a dogs that are a little bit more impulsive, a little more excitable. So it means, okay, this is what is currently happening. My dog mauling me every time I get food out, right? <laughs> this yeah. is what I would like to happen. Maybe <laughs> settle on a mat or relax on a bed while I eat. The dog's not bothering me. I can sit and eat in peace. So start that behavior of relax on a bed when your food isn't an out because your food is just an added distraction. Yeah. So we start teaching that behavior, right? And then we might transition to... I'm going to test that behavior out while I have food around, but I'm also going to use management. So yeah. maybe I have that bed in an X pen, mm -hmm. or maybe I put the teenager on a body harness mm -hmm. and tether them to a doorknob. Mm -hmm. So they still have access to their bed, but can't reach me in case they make a mistake. Right. And I'm still reinforcing the dog every once in a while for hanging out on that bed, but that management is kind of in place to help make sure that the puppy keeps doing the right thing when I bring out that, you know, added distraction. And remember yeah. too, that a lot of these things that were eventually we want to incorporate our dogs in our life, they're hard, right? Yeah. They're like build up to this behavior. So yeah. <laughs> we have to sometimes get creative with our training plans on incorporating management so that that expectation of human has food and I can be here and I can be well behaved starts like, oh, where am I? All the way over here, right? And slowly as they do well, builds up and up and up and up in difficulty until eventually our dogs can do that skill without that constant reinforcement and without that management. Yeah. And I think it's important to add to that, to make sure that you are rewarding their, their choice. I know mm -hmm. that there's a lot of people um, including, you know, some of the clients that I have now too, where, yes, I'll start off by saying, okay, we're starting with recall training. We're putting them on a leash and they'll be like a leash. And I'm like, yes, yes, we're going to be putting the dog. And they were just like, but aren't they attached to me if they're on a leash? And I was just like being attached and paying attention are two completely different things. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> um, you, I guess, remembering that your dog is going to make a choice. Uh -huh. He is. He's going to choose to lie down on that place cot or stand there while he is tethered and still stare at you and drool at your food. Yeah. And the most crucial moment and point is to reward that good choice, uh -huh. which is I'm going to lie down and I'm going to either engage with what you've already given me and not, you know, because um, as you're adding those distractions, I think some people really get frustrated because the dog takes a step back. Yeah. Like, no, I've taught you this behavior. You should, you will, but no, the behavior has multiple different layers to it. 
Yeah. You know, so um, yes, I can lie on place while you're standing there and feeding me frequently. And maybe we've worked up to me lying on place and you being far away from me. And, but I have not done, I lie on place. You turn on the television and you've got a porterhouse steak in front of you. I haven't done that one yet. That is so, so much harder. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'm big on rewarding choices. I do that all day long. It's it's a big part of how I raise my dogs because I don't want to have to be the person that's micromanaging them all the time, right? So I, I walk around with a treat bag or a vest with treats. I've got treat stations all over the house so that when I see them doing something good, I can be like, brilliant. Yes, thank you, right? And pay them for it. And I think that's actually a big piece that people are missing when they are using management, right? We I think a lot of people are completely separating management it often means that we're capturing those good choices when we are using management right like for example a lot of puppies that want to be with people have a hard time being alone in X pens, right? Especially if I'm in the same space, they're like, but I can't touch you, come closer, right? So we see them maybe vocalizing and putting their feet up on the X pen and trying to crawl towards us, right? But I'm thinking to myself, your puppy just sat down for a moment, pay that, right? Yeah. Like yeah. that management is there to prevent unwanted, but we also need to reward those good choices yeah. that the puppy or the dog makes with that management there. And, you know, again, that that eating dinner example is great because if I have the dog um, in an X pen or on a tether, they've got their settle mat, they could still choose to bark at me. Yeah. Right? They could still choose to jump up. But if they choose the right thing, Heck yes, I'm reinforcing that because reinforcing that calm behavior is what is eventually going to get me to the place where I don't have to have that management in place and the dog can then seamlessly be integrated into my life. Not to mention ignoring the one that you didn't want. Like that is, it can be so hard. And I know even as a trainer, sometimes I slip up because I like sometimes I like to be goofy with my dogs. So mm -hmm. like if they demand bark at me, I'll be like, and exactly what did you want? But they, <laughs> they, 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 they got what they wanted. They wanted yeah. my attention. Right. Yeah. Um, and they remembering as a trainer, I know that me doing that has basically enticed my dog <laughs> to continue performing that behavior. Yeah. But sometimes the hard time, the hard thing for, um, a, a pet owner to realize is that you're giving them attention for the wrong thing, mm -hmm. right? Like they are yeah. doing it for a specific reason and you're giving them that attention for the wrong thing. Therefore, gradually making it more difficult to erase that behavior. If you take that moment and when they bark instead of lie down, kind of that didn't do it. And mm -hmm. then they lie down and you can be like, yes, Mm -hmm. that is the way you get my attention. Yeah. It can like you could have caused that initial barking behavior because you never entertained it to go into extinction right away. Mm -hmm. If you are, if you are that quick about which decision gets the, gets the payment. Yeah. Um, and I think that can be hard sometimes for pet parents to think about. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> And I know because I watch it all the time and, and, you know, it's, it, it is something that it, it takes a little bit of practice, uh -huh. but basically what I tell them is think about what you want to see. Uh -huh. Think about what you want to see. If what you want to see is not your puppy biting on your sleeve right now, then move away from the puppy uh -huh. or back up a little bit so that the puppy is no longer attached to your sleeve or, or reaching to bite at you. Yeah. And then wait for that puppy to make a choice. If the puppy comes back to try and bite your sleeve, remove the situation from the puppy. Uh -huh. And um, sometimes what I'll see is that the puppy will start biting and they're just like, oh, OK. You know? <laughs> and it's just like when I say ignore, I don't mean ignore it like that. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, truthfully ignore it. Don't look at them. Don't talk to them. Don't touch them. And it can be so hard for I mean, again. 
as a trainer, there are certain times I have Malamutes, so they're vocal and they don't yeah. bark, but they'll walk around the house and, Ooh, you know, and yeah. it's ridiculous. And there are certain times they do it for attention and certain times they're just kind of having a conversation with themselves, but it's hard to ignore that. You know, it's yeah. hard to ignore the bark. It's hard to ignore the feet rattling on the X pen cage, but just remember that every time you ignore it, it's going to get easier for you to ignore it. And every time you pay the, the puppy or the teenager for what you want instead, that's going to get easier for them too. So, you know, buckling down and being strong in the beginning can really go a long way in terms of helping you expedite that process with, with the training as well. Yeah. And essentially, I, I tell people because in puppy culture, we do what's called manding, right? Uh -huh. we, we teach the puppies how to say please the correct way I or the way that we would like. It's the favorable way, right? Yeah. Because nothing about their behavior is incorrect. <laughs> They're performing it. Nothing about it is incorrect, but it's not favorable to human lifestyle, right? Yeah. Or living with us. And um, lost my train of thought there for a second, but um, more or less... What I try to tell people is you're teaching a dog how to get attention from mm -hmm. you. You're teaching a dog how to behave while you're eating, you know, and what's going to get them, you know, basically the easiest way to get to the, the cookie is to do it this way, not the other way. Yep. The easiest way for me to tell you, yes, good boy, is by responding this way, not this way. So um, that's what I try to kind of explain mm -hmm. to um, my clients is that nothing that your dog is doing is actually bad, right? It's not bad. They're responding the way they know how. Yeah. But if you want a different response, you have to pay that response. Yep. So. Yep. Absolutely. I hope that from this conversation, people can get inspired to use management and not overuse it you know, and realize that there is an appropriate way to use these tools and that these tools can be combined with training to expedite the learning process and make it, you know, easier for everybody. That's the goal, right, is to kind of streamline that training so that we're only getting success, we're only seeing positive changes from our dogs. Do you have any last pieces of advice or, or tips for people on management? Um. Actually, I want to I, I want to take it back a quick second because yeah. I know we live in 2021, right? Mm -hmm. And we have been growing as trainers and owners. You know, we are not the same people that we were, you know, 50, 60 years ago. But keep in mind that there are techniques that still work. Remember, like we didn't really crate dogs a lot back in the day we used to put them in a laundry room we used to give them newspaper we used to give them a little bed and that's kind of how they ended up learning how to do all these things what we didn't have in those days were you know this sophisticated methodology with basic obedience training yeah. but we still had a form of management and that form of management did work for a lot of people yeah. and you know dogs were still very intuitive then so if they were able to use that when they didn't have all of the sophistication <laughs> clearly it is something that we can still use today right we can still use these looser forms of management rather than putting the dog in a crate every single time right yeah. we can still use hey, I'm going to leave you in the laundry room with some newspaper and, uh, you know, uh, toys, you know, chew toys. Um, I'm going to, obviously, we have better tools to use now than just yeah. newspaper and chew toys. Yeah. You know, um, and when you need to get taken out, I will take you out. But just in case I'm not in time, I have that there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I also want to remind people that um, the way you manage the, the potty training part, because I know that that's a huge argument sometimes with people mm -hmm. is that the puppy is in the crate and, you know, uh, there are some dogs that won't choose to mess in the crate and there's some dogs that will choose to mess in the crate, you know, yeah. so it's not like that doesn't really define um, your, your potty training technique. It's the consistency of bringing the dog out and reinforcing them for where they go potty. Newspaper, a crate. Uh, a potty patch, all of that is an intermediary, you know, 
tool that you were using because we're not perfect and we won't always get there, but at least the dog has somewhere to relieve themselves that doesn't make us have to use a mop and bucket, you know, um, every time. So just sort of that little reminder, it's not, you know, <clears throat> it's okay to use other forms of management other than a crate when you're raising a puppy. And sometimes it's actually a little bit more humane, in my opinion, to use other forms of management when you're raising a puppy. And that doesn't mean you don't crate train your puppy. You know, so those are the things that I would recommend that people think about um, a little bit because realistically, yeah, you know, you can use any form um, or management tool and it should be effective as long as your training is consistent. Right. <laughs> yeah, I think that's huge. I think that's huge. You know, we get stuck on doing things a certain way and, you know, crates have been used for a long time, but again, it's, it's not the only tool. And, and just because it's not what we choose to keep our dog confined in, say in the living room while we're working from home, doesn't mean our dog isn't going to be crate trained. You know, in fact, there's the likelihood of them liking it more because we're giving them more choice. We're giving them more freedom while still taking care of their needs and making sure that our house is not destroyed. Right. Yeah. But kind of giving them a little more time to get adjusted to it versus just putting them in the crate. Right. It's not something we just put our dogs into. It is something we train them to enjoy and training takes time. Yeah. So just because you brought home a new puppy and, and it was crated at the breeders doesn't mean that it'll right off the bat be comfortable at your home. So giving them the space, giving them the choice and giving them the time that they need to get acquainted with that space at their own pace. Yeah. Yep. I think that's huge. Well, Ashley, thank you so much for joining us today. This was a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. No, not a problem. I was happy to be here. <laughs>